Central Texas, 1845. Nestled amongst the centuries-old oak trees in spring-fed creeks sits an idyllic farmstead. Its owners, likely immigrants from Germany, have meticulously built a small but sturdy cabin and maintained their crops and livestock herds through daily, arduous labor. Their efforts, however, have proven to be tragically in vain, as the entire family now lies prostrate and cold in various positions about the farmstead. The most recent victims of the Comanche raids that have been terrorizing the entirety of the Texas Hill Country for weeks now. This family has been targeted not because they have developed any personal animus between themselves and the Comanche, but because their mere presence here in what was known to the Spanish as Comancheria is tantamount to a declaration of war against the feared and fearsome lords of the Southern Plains. Their once bustling farmstead now lies still. The scene that unfolded only hours before must have been horrific, but it was not at all unique. The Comanche raiding party, quite large in this particular case, numbering between two to three hundred, had swept down from the surrounding hills, killed all who posed even the most tacit threat of resistance, and made off with all of the prisoners and horses that they were able to. Now, as the sun makes its ascent, burning off the morning mist and making the day stiflingly hot by noontime, the Comanche are on their way west. They have been traveling hard since their early morning raid on the farmstead. Their raiding has indeed proven successful as they have gathered a large herd of horses stolen from several of the ranches surrounding the city of San Antonio. But the spoils of their effort are now proving to be a notable hindrance in their race to put distance between themselves and the Texans who would invariably pursue them. However, with the number of warriors present in this raiding party, the Comanche are not too concerned about the retaliation of a people who had proven all but inept in pursuing and engaging them. The Spanish had made their efforts in combating Comanche raiding, as had the Mexican government, as had virtually every sizable tribe in Texas. But at this point in 1845, with very few exceptions, the Comanche have operated with virtual impunity throughout the whole of Texas. They refer to the Texians and Mexicans as their livestock keepers, a people fit only to hold on to the vast horse herds until the Comanches see fit to take them. Their disdain for the settlers is certainly primarily due to their chosen location, as encroaching anywhere on the vast expanses of their rightful empire is an offense punishable by death. However, the Comanche also hold in contempt any culture, be it native or European-based, that practices sedentary agriculture. This is a decidedly distasteful livelihood by Comanche standards. They view their highly mobile hunting and raiding culture as a more masculine, honorable way of life and therefore assumed it to be universally preferable. However limited their cultural viewpoint may be, their tactics and practices have proven highly effective. The Comanche's ascension from perpetually beleaguered hunter-gatherers to the wealthiest tribe on the whole of the American plains has been perhaps as rapid a transition as any society has undergone in human history. By the early 19th century, they have taken over virtually the entirety of the southern plains, from present-day Kansas all the way to South Texas. However, their wealth is not only in land, but in horses. Because of their geographic location at the southernmost point of the plains, the area that held the greatest concentration of settlements and of horses in the early 1800s, the Comanche were privy to the greatest selection of animals and the most opportunities to carry out raids. This led to the Comanche possessing far more horses than any other tribe. A typical young Comanche warrior might possess a herd of several dozen or even several hundred horses, a number comparable to even the wealthiest chiefs of more northerly tribes like the Sioux and Cheyenne. The economic importance of this advantage borders on incalculable, and the desire to maintain this advantage has left the Comanche with an unslakable thirst to continue adding to their collective and respective equine portfolios. Efforts to stop them, especially in the last few weeks, have proven maddeningly ineffective to both Texan farmers and government officials. As would happen several times throughout Texas history as Comanche attacks intensified, whole farmsteads were being abandoned by families in fear of becoming the next macabre recollection shared amongst terrified neighbors and townspeople. It seemed to many that, for all intents and purposes, there was no way to effectively combat a force who struck in lightning quick raids and seemed to disappear into the western landscape just as quickly. The situation presented such a novel problem 
it seemed only a novel solution would suffice. In the decades prior, small forces under the directive of Secretary of State Stephen F. Austin had patrolled the ranges of the Texas frontier with the intention of finding and engaging the Comanche. It was hoped that a more offensive approach might dissuade further attacks. But the ranging companies, who would come to be known as the Texas Rangers, have managed to achieve only marginal success in tracking down and engaging the Comanche. They are perpetually underfunded, poorly equipped, and their ranks are made up of young men who largely have found no place in other parts of society. Most are men under the age of 25 who have come to Texas for the express purpose of violence and retribution. Every year, young men ride into San Antonio and eagerly sign on with the Rangers, boasting of all the Comanche scalps they are soon to take and of all the beautiful Texas maidens they would soon rescue. They would ride out of town at the first mention of a nearby Comanche attack, resplendent in all their martial glory, only to never be seen again. For the lucky among them, death would come quickly in battle by the 14-foot Comanche lances and stocky, short arrows that whip through the air with enough velocity to pass through the torso of a buffalo bull and stick into the hard prairie ground. For the unfortunate souls unlucky enough to be taken prisoner, their ends would not come so quickly. Many a young ranger would meet a prolonged, painful demise at the hands of Comanche torturers. For years, their success in pursuing Comanche raiding parties and preventing atrocities on the Texas frontier was a sporadic affair. Occasionally, they had been fortuitous enough to surprise a Comanche camp and rescue a captive or two, but they had continually struggled to match their adversaries in mobility and in the volume of fire they were able to amass. By 1845, however, this is beginning to change because of two critical factors now working in the Rangers' favor. The first is the advent of the Rangers' adoption of the Colt Patterson revolver. Designed by New Jersey inventor Samuel Colt, the Colt Patterson is the precursor to the six-shot Colt Walker revolver that would come out two years later in 1847. Named after its inventor in his hometown of Patterson, New Jersey, the Colt Patterson boasts a five-shot cylinder and an imposingly large build. The five shots have to be loaded into the cylinder, and the cylinder would have to be detached to reload, necessitating that a ranger in the field keep several preloaded cylinders on his person. While it does not have the ease of use, capacity, nor firepower of its successor, the Colt Patterson is a revolutionary weapon. However, years after its invention, the Colt Patterson had been relegated to relative obscurity, as there was no military or law enforcement force who yet knew how to best employ the new weapon. Texas had first ordered 180 of the new revolvers from Colt, intending them for use by the New Republic's Navy. However, the Navy was never able to employ them to any meaningful ends and thus the technology seemed destined for the proverbial scrap heap. However, before the Texas government gives up hope on the utility of the Colt Patterson, they decide that perhaps the Rangers might be able to employ them. While this may seem an obvious conclusion to draw in hindsight, the notion of mounted gunmen attacking the Comanche in the same manner the Comanche attacked them was an essentially foreign notion. For centuries, as Americans had made their dogged advance eastward, combat against the native tribes of the eastern woodlands had involved fighting on foot. The terrain often did not lend itself to fighting from horseback. Furthermore, the rifles and muskets used by the Americans and their predecessors necessitated a lengthy, cumbersome reloading process that was next to impossible while riding atop a horse at full gallop. This gap in tactical prowess has allowed the Comanche to operate largely unfettered, as they are able to maneuver their mounts and unleash arrows at a rate the average Texan simply cannot match while footbound and firing sporadically from a single-shot weapon. But now, with the advent of a repeating weapon that can be fired multiple times before reloading and can be operated from horseback, the odds are becoming more favorable for the Rangers. But while the Rangers in general are a motley, combative lot, often prone to drunkenness and using coarse language, they have for too long lacked a leader with a clear, present vision on how to turn the tide against their Comanche foe. But in the last few years, a young Tennessean, with boyish looks and a seemingly unshakable demeanor, has been ascending the ranger ranks. The progeny of a family with a long military tradition, he had come to Texas in the 1830s, narrowly missing his chance to serve in the Texas Revolution of 1836 and 37. He had, instead, taken up work as part of a surveyor party, perhaps the most dangerous job in Texas at the time. The Comanche were well aware of surveyor parties, and had surmised that their purpose was to measure out the allotments of their land 
that the Texas government was unjustly giving away. Thus, surveillance parties were subject to some of the most gruesome tortures the Comanche practiced, from being staked out alive on the plains, to be eaten by wild animals and burned by the sun, to heaping hot coals upon the unfortunate victim's torso. He had managed to avoid such unfortunate fates and was able to sign on with the Texas Rangers. For the last several years, he has been working his way through the Rangers' ranks. His name is John Coffey Hayes, better known as Jack Hayes. He will prove to be the second important factor in changing the way the Rangers fight. In a world of the big-bodied ruffians that comprise most of the Ranger forces, Hayes stands out for both his slender build and his civilized manners. He has a calm, high-toned voice, dark hair, and the cool, calculating eyes of a dyed-in-the-wool killer. Time and time again over the preceding years, the Rangers in Hayes' company have marveled at his ability to switch instantaneously from an affable, thoughtful conversationalist to a snarling, myopically focused combat leader. The times he has put himself in mortal danger from enemy fire, all while doling out concise, clear orders to the rangers in his command, seem too numerous to count by this point in his career. For months now, Hayes and his rangers have been in San Antonio, setting off occasionally to patrol the surrounding territory and training incessantly with their new revolvers. Time and again, each ranger rides through an obstacle course of sorts while firing at targets set on fence posts. Hayes drills the men until not only they, but their horses are fully comfortable with the demands of combat conducted on horseback. Some of the rangers gripe quietly that they are tired of the incessant drilling, but all of them know the time for them to employ their skills is close at hand. That time finally comes late in the afternoon of the day the unfortunate homesteaders are killed. Hayes receives word that, yet again, the Comanches have wrought their particular brand of havoc on the surrounding countryside. He is informed that the offending raiding party is on their way west, towards the Frio River. Within minutes, Hayes and a party of 42 rangers have assembled at the western edge of the city of San Antonio. Hayes briefs them on the specifics of the route he intends to take, and informs the men, much to their satisfaction, that their intent is to catch up with the Comanche, kill as many as possible, and recover the horses they have stolen. The rangers ride hard, knowing that with the small size of their force and the Comanche's cumbersome number of warriors and horses, they can very well catch up to the Comanche before they are able to disperse onto the vast expanses of West Texas. Riding with them, as is often the case, is a native scout. He is a Lipan Apache chief named Flacco, and he may be the linchpin to this entire ranger operation. Chief Flacco has grown up combating the Comanche, as they were, at least for varying periods of the 19th century, mortal enemies to his tribe. He has stayed in and around San Antonio for the last several years, and by this time has built a strong friendship with Jack Hayes. The two men, both warriors and leaders of men, have an immense, enduring respect for each other. It is Chief Flacco who has encouraged Hayes to fight the Comanche on their own terms. Now, his tracking ability, far more honed and refined than even the most astute rangers, will make the critical difference in whether the rangers will even find the Comanche raiding party. After traveling roughly 60 miles, though, the entire party consists that the Comanche are close. Finally, as they come within sight of the Frio River, the rangers spot the Comanche. Seemingly simultaneously, the Comanche spot them. Thinking a force of several dozen to be no match for their force of two to three hundred, the Comanche form a battle line between the rangers and the horses and prepare to receive a ranger attack. For their part, the rangers know that there is not a second to lose. They have trained to engage the Comanche on the Comanche's terms, and this meant that the time to launch a full-scale, head-on attack was now. At the time the two parties see each other, Hayes is riding on a mule towards the rear of the ranger column. Now aware of the urgency of an immediate attack, Hayes spurs his mount forward as fast as possible. On his way towards the front, he comes upon another ranger on a fine horse who looks to be reining his mount in in order to keep him from charging forward at full speed. Hayes calls out to the man to hurry forward, but the ranger insists that the horse is trying to run away with him, and it is all he can do to keep the horse from galloping away completely uncontrolled. Hayes, in a rush to get to the front of the column and dubious of the man's claims, insists that they switch mounts. The ranger takes over the mule while Hayes jumps astride the skittish horse. Almost at the instant Hayes touches down in the saddle, 
the horse is off in a full sprint towards the front, paying no heed to the directives of the reins, the stirrups, nor Hayes's shouts. The front of the column, with their revolvers drawn and teeth bared, are now charging forward towards the Comanche line. In the lead, eager to engage the Comanche, is Chief Flacco. As he rides, he sees Hayes fly by, riding at full speed past the front of the ranger column. He has no idea that Hayes is aboard a runaway horse and assumes that his friend's near suicidal penchant for bravery in combat has reached a new, inexplicable, and ill-advised level. The chief, a proud warrior himself, decides in an instant that he will not let his friend ride off to certain death alone, nor will he let a Texan steal all the glory in combat against his hated enemy. Chief Flacco urges his horse on, faster and faster, until it is just himself and Hayes between the charging rangers to their rear and the two to three hundred strong column of Comanche warriors to their front. Both men, now committed to the attack, begin to fire their revolvers as the ground rapidly closes between themselves and the Comanche. To the rangers riding behind them, this charge the two men have undertaken seems suicidal. Death, for both men, despite their gallantry, seems imminent. But the Comanche are so astounded by the reckless bravery of the charge, they suffer a momentary bout of paralysis by analysis, unsure of what exactly is happening. This brief lapse in vigilance means that Hayes and Flacco, instead of crashing into a hail of bullets and arrows, merely rush through the lines of their adversaries. The rangers, still charging in a force 41 strong towards the Comanche, seize the opportunity presented by a confounded enemy and pour fire into the Comanche ranks. Much in the fashion of the Comanche, they make several whirlwind attacks striking the Comanche lines and then retracting before striking again. Hayes and Flacco are able to flank the Comanche and make their way back to the ranger forces in time to inflict casualties of their own against the warriors. The Comanche put up a hellacious fight for a time, but are overwhelmed by the volume of fire this small contingent is able to inflict upon them. Finally, the Comanche break ranks, and in the words of J.W. Wilbarger in his 1889 work, Indian Depredations in Texas, a panic at length seized them, and they fled and scattered in every direction. After the fight, as many horses as can be recovered are rounded up, and the party returns to San Antonio. Chief Flacco, in part astonished by his friend's bravery and in part amused that the charge had been the result of a panicked horse, bestowed a lasting nickname upon the captain that would be known to his friends and enemies alike. From that day on the Frio River Ford, Captain Hayes will be known to many in Texas as Bravo Too Much or Brave Too Much. The name certainly has a tinge of good-natured ribbing between friends, but its meaning is also starkly serious and, as time will prove again and again, inarguably apt. Chief Flacco and Jack Hayes will go on to many more fights against the Comanche, and Hayes will carve out his own brutal legacy in the battlefields of the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1847. He will eventually move to California with the advent of the 1849 gold rush, and the two old friends will never see each other again. Flacco would go on to become a legendary figure in Texas history whose story deserves an episode all its own. But the bloody war for control of Texas is not over. It will in fact carry on for decades more and see countless lives lost on both sides. And ultimately, the end of the Comanche's way of life. But the innumerable accounts of the heroics and villainy wrought by Texans and Comanches alike are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Thank you for tuning into this episode of History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to support our work, click the link below in the description to become a subscriber on Patreon. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History Too Real for the Westerns.